Hi, it's Greg here with another Vim screencast. And tonight I want to talk about moving to Sierra. Now, if you've seen previous screencasts by me, you'll know that I am a Carabiner user. So in episode nine here, I went into great detail about the different kinds of keyboard remapping tricks that you can do with Carabiner. Um, and in episode 41, I went into using Colmac as a Vim user, um, where I think I also mentioned Carabiner there. Um, but basically, this is a pretty low-level tool. I believe it's a kernel driver, a keyboard driver that uh, injects itself into the kernel as a kernel extension. Um, so it runs at a very low level and is able to intercept keyboard, keyboard events well before other APIs in the operating system. And it can do things that you can't do with other software. So, for example, it can change the function of the caps lock key. Um, and it can do much more than just map a key to another key. It can do things like, for example have you tap both shift keys to turn caps lock on, which means that you can turn caps lock itself into another key, yet still retain the ability to turn caps lock on in a useful way. Um, and a bunch of other stuff uh, that I have used Carabiner for and have deeply ingrained into my muscle memory. Um, so I knew when Sierra was in beta that Carabiner didn't work with it. Um, and furthermore, that it wasn't going to work. Um, and here's an issue here uh, on the Carabiner issue track, 180 comments, and many of these have a huge number of reactions. A lot of people use this tool and love it. And in here are sharing their workarounds for how to recreate some of the functionality of Carabiner using alternative means on Sierra. Um, one of those alternative means is to use Carabiner Elements, which is a rewrite. Uh, and maybe one day this will be done and it'll be great, but at the moment it's still pretty primitive and you can mostly only just do simple mappings of one key to another key. You certainly can't do anything like the double tap shift thing that I mentioned. And you can't do some things that I truly depend on. Um, and so what I want to show in this screencast is how I've used a tool called Hammerspoon to recreate the parts of Carabiner that I really can't live without on Sierra. So... Hammerspoon probably deserves a, a screencast of its own. Um, I originally got into it as a replacement for a tool called Slate, which allowed me to like move the windows around on the keyboard uh, like that. Um, but it can do a hell of a lot more than that. And one of the things it can do is give you access to the so-called Event Tap API, which is an API provided by Apple, fairly high up and fairly low level in the kind of food chain. Not as low level as you would get if you wrote an actual key dri uh, keyboard driver that ran in the kernel, but still low enough that you can observe key events globally. Um, pretty much all key events except those that occur in the context of secure keyboard entry, so password dialogues. Um, basically, hooking into the accessibility API, you can not only inspect all keyboard events as they come through, but you can stop them from going through. You can inject new ones. You can hold events in a pending queue and send them later on. Um, and you can implement any logic that you like as long as you can express it in Lua, which of course you generally can because Lua is a Turing complete programming language. Um, so let's have a look at what I've done in Lua here. Now I'm not a Lua programmer uh, and everything that I've done with it has been kind of self-taught in the service of getting my Hammerspoon config to do the things that I want. But basically, I've made this file here um, called eventtap.lua that accesses this event tap API to recreate the functionality that I need. So I'm going to look at three pieces of functionality in this screencast. Um, the first one is something that I talked about when I was discussing folding, and that is the desire to map the tab key to toggle folds. Now, the trouble with mapping the tab key is that in the terminal, when you hit tab, it actually sends control I to the terminal. And that in turn means that you can't distinguish between an actual tab press and somebody hitting control I. And so you can't map tab without remapping control I. And that means that you can't move in and out of the jump list with control I and control O because every time you hit control I, it's just gonna do whatever you had mapped to tab. Um, so the way I dealt with this in Carabina was to turn control I only in the terminal into F6. And then in my Vim files, I could listen to F6. And effectively, that way I could have two mappings that were independent from each other. The tab mapping would end up toggling folds and the F6 mapping would end up doing what Control-I used to do, which is move me through the jump list. 
Um, and so let's have a look at how that is implemented in here. Um, it's gonna be in here somewhere. Here you go. So basic, basically I've come up with a configuration here that in apps with these bundle identifiers, it is going to take the I key um, and whenever the control key is down, it's gonna turn it into F6. So let's look at how that is implemented just quickly. So basically we look for, we look through all the mappings and make sure that the flags match, the flags being the, the state of the control key. Um, we check if the frontmost application matches one of the permitted bundle IDs. And if those conditions are both true, then we create a brand new key event, which is this F6 that I defined. Um, and we stop propagation of the original control line and we stop that from going through. So you can see that that works because I'm hitting tab and getting through. And similarly, if I kind of jump around this file a bit, um, both control I and control O still work. And you'll notice there with the display of what keys I'm hitting, when I hit control I, it's actually sending um, F6. So that was pretty straightforward to implement. Slightly harder is this cording slash tapping functionality that I have on both caps lock and return. So caps lock, when I tap it, I want it to be backspace because that's what it is supposed to be in the Colmac keyboard layout. I mean, when I hold it, I want it to be repeated backspace. However, when I cord it with another key, I want it to serve as control. And I want the opposite to happen on the other side of the keyboard, which is the enter key. So it should be enter when tapped, repeated enter when held, and control when corded. Um, so I'm not gonna go into great detail about how this is implemented. Um, I'm actually gonna jump on the whiteboard and talk about some of the issues that I had to work through in order to make this happen. So hopefully the audio will be okay, even though I'm gonna be a little farther away than usual. Um, but let's look at a couple of example scenarios for uh, keyboard events. Normally, um, if we draw a graph where time is kind of extending across the board like this. So this is T0 and time goes that way. The first thing that's going to happen is we're gonna get a key down event. So uh, just say, this is the caps lock key. We get a key down event at this point. And for some time after that, the, uh, the key is held down. And then at a later point, we get a key up event. And the, the key is inert for the rest of the time. Um, during this period that it is held down, we might actually get keyboard repeat events. So those are basically key down events, but with an auto repeat flag set. So maybe there's a few of those along the way. Um, if I then come along and hit another key, like let's say X, um, it originally starts in its neutral position. I'm gonna get a T down event, a key down event. It's gonna be held down for a while and then I'll release it, I'll get the key up event. And you can see here that these events don't overlap. So there's no ambiguity there. We know that it was probably intended to be a backspace followed by an X. Easy. Um, what happens when they overlap though? Uh, so let's just say I wanted this to actually be control X. So in that case, the way I would press the key, uh, after the caps lock key is down, I'm gonna key down on the X and then I'm gonna key up and release. And you'll notice that the key down happened after the key down of the control key, and the key up happened before I released the control key. That way I'm able to tell that it was a chord and not a tap. So I, um, I implemented this and there are a few issues. Uh, one is that I discovered that when you type uh, using modifiers, you do a thing called rollover. Um, now I knew this was the case when you, you just type normally. Uh, so for example, just say I'm typing fast and I, I type the word bar. I'm gonna key down bar and key up. Um, and then I'm probably gonna key down A and key up before I've released the B. Um, and finally the R, I'm gonna key that down and key it up. And you'll notice there's this overlap here. Um, that's called rollover. Um, and what I didn't realize until I'd implemented this is that you actually do rollover all the time, even when you're doing something like control C, control V, control X, or any of those other frequently used shortcuts. Um, and so all of these key presses actually end up looking like this. Uh, so they basically start 
the key down happens after the modifier key down, but before the modifier key up. And the modifier key up happens before the key up that accompanies the modifier. Um, and that is annoying to deal with because that case is totally indistinguishable from this case. They look exactly the same. Um, so how does one solve this? Um, I'm pleased to find that it is possible with just some careful um, tuning of thresholds to make it work and do pretty much what you want all the time. Um, so if you really want to know how it works, you can look at that event tap file, um, which I is, I'm continuing to evolve. <laughs> Um, but basically the notion is uh, if, if you, you have some critical points in the timeline or the life cycle of a key press, um, the first one would be, uh, you know, key down. Um, and then there's an initial key repeat delay where if you hold the key still for this amount of time, nothing is going to happen. But then once that delay has passed, you're going to get your first key repent, key repeat event. And as long as the key is down after that, you're going to get additional key repeat events until you get the next and final key up event. So you've effectively got this interval here, um, and you've got an interval here that's defined. These two intervals are, de are controlled in the system preferences. Um, and then obviously you've got this variable interval here, which is how long elapsed between key down and key up. Um, so effectively, the logic that I think I've implemented, it's now a few days ago, so I may not be entirely uh, right on the details, is that if you get something that looks like it could be a rollover, uh, you effectively have to put it in a pending queue uh, because you don't necessarily know what is going to happen uh, until a certain amount of time has elapsed. So uh, normally what would happen if this were a control key and not a caps lock key, um, as soon as you get the key down event for the X, the action would actually fire immediately. It wouldn't wait until either of these key ups to decide what to do. Um, in our case, we actually do want to wait a little while. Um, so the logic that I've effectively implemented is if the key down is very close after the key down event of the modifier, um, that is you know, in the, of the order of say 200 milliseconds, um, although I had this configurable on a per modifier basis, because experimentally, it seems that I'm more likely to roll quickly on the left side. Um, that's the modifier I use the most. So if you get this key down within 200 milliseconds, you can assume that it's uh, like an intentional rollover that is a, an intent to cord the key combination, and you can fire it immediately. Um, otherwise, and let's just say that uh, you know, if this is zero here, and key repeat is going to be around, you know, half a second, so 0 0.5. Um, and we've set that threshold there where we, we're going to assume that it's intentional cording rollover is 0 0.2 seconds. Um, there is a window here in which we, we're going to hold the key in a pending queue uh, and decide whether or not, we're going to basically defer our judgment to see whether or not it's a cording event or not. Um, if it is released before hitting this barrier here, we know for sure that it was an intent to cord. Otherwise, it's going to hit uh, potentially this repeating zone, and we're going to assume that it's the opposite, that it's a tap. Um, so that's the basic overview um, of what I've done there with this event tap file. And so uh, the other thing that I want to implement, but I haven't finished yet, um, I want to re-implement the so-called space FN layout. Um, and the notion of that was that you'd be able to hold down space and uh, use um, J, K, L, and I. Those are the keys on the, the QWERTY keyboard. They're, they're kind of an inverted T. Um, on Colmac, they're different keys. Um, but the notion is, yeah, let's, let's put an inverted T cursor uh, grid that we can access without having to move our hand over to the cursor. And um, we'll just get it by holding down space. Um, and so for that, we're basically going to have to extend this model a little bit um, and have it such that it fires only when the, the keys that are the cursor keys are lifted up before the space bar. So uh, in a case oops, in a case like this, just say uh, instead of caps lock and X, we have space and H or whatever. Um, 
we would assume that this is normal typing rollover, so space then H um, in this case. If we want this to be considered the space FN layout and have this act like a cursor key, we have to hold it in the pending queue and see a key release event here before the key release event of the spacebar. And furthermore, we, this, this key down event has to happen before a threshold. Because otherwise, uh, typing is going to feel laggy. Because you, you basically can't let the space event through until you've waited long enough to see if the user is going to court it with another key um, and then release that other key. Um, and if this key were held too long, then we would want to let it through anyway. Because, like I said, we want to have some kind of sense of fluid typing. Um, so that's what I'm going to uh, work on next. Uh, but it's not the part that I missed the most and absolutely needed. So I implemented the part that I needed first. So that was pretty wordy and probably not that clear, but have a look at the code um, and rejoice that you can do most things that you wanted to do with Carabina with Hammerspoon instead. I found it to be pretty reliable. Uh, there's a couple of little gotchas there. Um, one is that you want to make sure that your event handlers don't get garbage collected, which was something that was happening to me where they would just like stop working after a while. And I had to make sure I had a global reference to them to make sure that they didn't get garbage collected. Um, and since I did that, I've had it not skip a beat, hasn't dropped any events on the floor. Um, it's been super reliable and I've been able to implement those features that I really needed. I know I will be able to implement space FN as well because there are no real technical barriers to that. Um, a couple of things that I know I can't implement. I can't implement double tap of the two shift keys to turn on caps lock because it seems like you can't programmatically control the caps lock key uh, without being a kernel extension. So we're back to square one again. Um, the other, for the, uh, the similar th reasons, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to implement what I had to make the so-called YubiKey work with the Colmac keyboard layout. Uh, that's unfortunate, but basically in the event tap API, you don't have any way of determining which input device the events came from, and therefore there's no way for me to know that the events are coming from the YubiKey and I can't remap them and fix them. So that's a shame. Um, and I'll, I'm looking for alternative workarounds there. Um, at the moment, I just have to switch back to US instead of Colmac whenever I need to use the YubiKey. Bit of a shame, but living with it. Okay, well, thanks for going through that little exercise with me, um, and I'll be back again soon with another Vim screencast.